My name is Don Huseman. <clears throat> I'm the Managing Director for Online Learning at the Wharton School, and I'm joined here today with my colleague from Emeritus, Dave Peritsky, who's the Director of Senior Executive Programs. Uh, we're here today to answer the question, uh, why should you come to business analytics? Uh, so uh, we will spend about <clears throat> the first half of this hour uh, presenting some information, an overview of the of the subject addressed in the course of the learning objectives, uh, the expectations of the participants, uh, the kinds of activities that we've arranged. Uh, and then we'll take your questions at the end uh, to help you make sure you're making the right decision as you invest your money and your time in this program. So we've uh, identified a set of kinds of questions that we attempt to answer uh, as we go through this course from the context of both the faculty who are teaching the course and also uh, your own expertise you bring to the table in the sense of the understanding of your industry, your region, your company. Uh, but as you can see from the nature of these questions, uh, the course topics are intended to be highly applied to your circumstances. So how can analytics improve my own business? What kind of data can I collect or use to make better uh, decisions? What kinds of questions can I ask for the data I've already got? Uh, and you know, what are leading companies in this field doing? So this, these types of applied questions coming out of the, um, the academic research that uh, the faculty represent um, for the state of the art of using data to inform business decisions is the heart of the matter for this course. So we've looked at um, a, a set of kind of profiles of individuals who have uh, taken the course in the past. We found that uh, it's a very uh, good benefit to people who are looking to learn more about the field of data analytics in general, to get a, a base reading, a level setting of basic concepts of data analytics, to understand how companies are currently using analytics. Uh, it's particularly useful for people who have been uh, charged with leading an analytics team in their own company. Uh, in that regard, we'll be exploring uh, the different types of analytic initiatives that you might want to consider undertaking. Descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. We'll get into some detail about that in a little bit. And also to how, how to ask the right questions. All of this begins with an effort to ask the right types of questions um, when your team is presenting any analyses that are based on data. A final one a profile that we found uh, of people who have uh, gotten a lot out of the course in the past is if you are a general manager or you're uh, an owner of a small business and you're interested in leveraging analytics across multiple areas of your business, you wear multiple hats in terms of running your business. Mm -hmm. So this course uh, has uh, proven to be useful for people uh, who fit that description as well. Uh, so let me ask for the next slide, a little bit about the choice of taking a business analytics uh, through the Wharton School. Uh, there are some distinctive features that I want to try to highlight. Uh, there's a lot of options that are out there in terms of uh, what's available uh, uh, online to study analytics. Uh, you may know the Wharton School is the first uh, collegiate uh, school of management. Uh, it was uh, established back in 1881. What you may not know <clears throat> is that the, at the heart of the Wharton School is really its research enterprise. And uh, the, uh, the way that faculty get uh, tenure at the Wharton School is not, has nothing to do really with their teaching or even their, their wide uh, publishing of books or articles uh, in general business magazines. It's all about their empirical research and the impact of their research on the a community of scholars who are studying a particular field of business. So that's the nature of uh, the faculty who are in this course. That's distinctive from what uh, you might find uh, in other courses where we have, um, uh, in some cases, people who are more practitioner oriented. So the faculty in this course are all tenured associate and full professors uh, from the Wharton School who bring their own research experience to the table. Without me ask uh, Dave for the next slide. This is a picture of Dean Erica James of the Wharton School, who makes the point that it's imp uh, important in today's environment to respond to change. We are uh, in unprecedented era uh, of uh, change as a result of COVID-19, uh, and it represents an unprecedented opportunity for businesses that are nimble and that are uh, 
uh, ready to be flexible and to address uh, new opportunities that are emerging as we come out of the COVID-19 experience uh, and uh, review a, a post-COVID uh, landscape in terms of what uh, COVID has done to each and each of our, uh, our marketplaces. So uh, we have uh, made a tradition here at the Wharton School of embracing uh, practitioners who are dealing with uh, a volatile, uncertain times. Uh, and uh, that is very much uh, at the uh, heart of this program as well. Let me ask Dave for the next slide here. Uh, the history of the Wharton School uh, has been a history of uh, learning how to apply data to inform specific business decisions. So uh, back even as uh, uh, in the 19th century, one of the Wharton professors at the time, Professor Emory Johnson, uh, had a, a history of studying uh, the flow of goods and services through the canal system in North America and an understanding of the profit and loss uh, uh, and the various tariffs that were uh, systems that were in place uh, for the control of those rail uh, the, of those <clears throat> water routes as well as railroad routes, um, and it was that understanding that informed the uh, planning around the Panama Canal. So you know, as we went through the 20th century, other professors picked up that history of uh, empirical based research uh, in uh, using the lens of their own specific academic. Uh, fields. So Professor Willits, who's an operations management uh, uh, researcher, created the first uh, business research uh, center, the industrial research unit. It's still at work today. Uh, uh, it was originally uh, uh, Professor Willits's uh, uh, students who uh, went to the floor of factories in the early 20th century to study bottlenecks, to study the flow of goods and services through a complex operation system. Uh, and to identify ways to optimize those flows. Uh, in the mid-century, Professor Paul Green uh, reinvented the field of market research. And in the, in the uh, mid 20th century market, marketing was considered more of a creative exercise. Professor Green and his fellows in the marketing department at Wharton uh, apply the scientific lens to the study of uh, market research. And you'll learn a little bit of the tools that came out of that era. In the 70s, Professor Simon Kuznets, who had been part of the Roosevelt administration during the war years and studied uh, bottlenecks uh, as the uh, manufacturing uh, sector of the US economy transitioned from a peacetime to a wartime footing, um, Professor Kuznets found methods for measuring the flow of goods and services and output uh, in a way that allowed him after the war to study the service sector, the agricultural sector, the mining sectors, the other sectors of the uh, US economy, coming up with some generic um, uh, metrics, one of which in, uh, was the uh, gross domestic product uh, that are, is now uh, in, included in many forecasting models at both the national uh, policy making level as well as for individual um, sectors of the economy. And then Professor Lawrence Klein uh, worked on the uh, early uh, development of the field of econometrics, where we took the data that Professor Kuznets and others were uh, generating that were descriptive in nature and built out forecasting models that allowed us to try to predict the future based on activities or decisions we make today. So from that history, you see sort of a, the background of the faculty who are coming to you to join in this course to study what the application of data to business decisions is like in the 21st century. So all the faculty associated with this class uh, have active roles in one of the 25 research centers that are actively involved on the Wharton campus, looking at uh, issues like the application of data to uh, people analytics, to the uh, identifying hiring decisions, uh, informing uh, promotion uh, decisions, uh, understanding uh, retention. Uh, similarly, Wharton's Customer Analytics Initiative uh, studies uh, the vast quantities of data that are now available to us from uh, online transactions uh, so that we better understand the, uh, the factors that drive customer preferences, uh, et cetera. So 25 research centers, we've selected from those uh, research centers, faculty who are actively involved working with uh, companies to who are pushing the application of data uh, to apply to specific decisions they're making in the marketplace today.
So with that in mind, um, let me uh, take a break here and hand the microphone over to my colleague, Dave Peritsky, who's going to walk you through uh, sessions of the course. Dave, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Don, and thank you, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this morning. Um, uh, for those who are on right now, so what are we here to cover? Um, I'm thrilled to be involved. Uh, Don, it's an honor to, to work with, with you and the team once again. Um, I've had the chance to be a, a course leader several times for this course as well, um, and I also um, work with several other um, larger scale programs, um, both at, at Wharton and throughout Emeritus, our operating partner. Um, but for this particular program, what we're looking to do, again, is, is using the applications, tools, and methods available, bridge the gap between what is often referred to as descriptive analytics, um, which is essentially a fancy word, or maybe not such a fancy word, to describe the stuff we already know. Um, as the old adage goes, we've gotten truly good at predicting the past. Uh, but now with that understanding, that increased level of understanding of the past, how do we then extract predictive value? How can we use the past to understand the future? How can we look at patterns? How can we look at trends? How can we look at different versions of the analytics that we have available and apply them to future, to understanding future outcomes? And then once we understand those outcomes, how do we then affect those outcomes in our favor? In other words, how do we then prescribe solutions or engage in prescriptive analytics? Um, and really, that's it, it, it engages this full, um, a bit of a virtuous circle here. And that's, that's, that's at the heart of what we talk about in this course. So to look through in a little bit more detail, these, this course has nine modules. So I'll run through them each a little bit quickly. Um, this is a team taught course. So you are getting the best and brightest. As, as Don said, these are all tenured professors um, who have been on the Wharton, the, the, uh, who are extremely popular on the, on the campus of the Wharton School. Um, in many cases, you'll meet these professors through the, the on-demand video programs. In several cases, you'll meet them live um, in the course through the live sessions. You'll also meet your course leaders, um, essentially your TAs who will be hosting weekly office hours, um, giving you a chance to interact, not just with the faculty team, but with one another. So again, these are these are asynchronous courses, but these 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 faculty are selected for the right for the reasons to be included in the course. And some, as I said, you'll meet live. So Raghu Iyengar is one who um, I believe you do have a live session with. Um, not only is he he is a the the king of all things when it comes to customer analytics. We'll talk about NPS, which is quite a um, which is a crowd favorite, um, but also looking at survey uh, with that proper survey gathering. Um, and really understanding how the descriptive analytics chain begins. And that's all in module one. Um, then we get to Santhilvira Raghavan, um, who is, um, is actually two modules uh, for us. Uh, looking at, um, we look at um, using recent past events to predict future. We get into forecasting. We get into, um, um, this is going to be a reminder for those who took these items in stats class. Now there are no prerequisites for this course, um, but again, a, a working knowledge of statistics certainly doesn't hurt. I would say statistics and microeconomics, uh, behavioral science, any of these, uh, even, even a little bit of uh, business management accounting, none of that will hurt you. Uh, if you do not have these areas of expertise, um, these courses are meant to compensate for that. In, in other words, we start from scratch and we just move uh, relatively quickly. Um, then we get into uh, we, we get into uh, Peter Fader, who's, who's well known for his work on the buy till you die model, um, arguably the most popular, the, the widely known um, uh, generator of that model. So we'll look at understand. We'll look at regression more generally. Again, a, a term from your statistics class. If you're not familiar with it, you will be. But also looking specifically at the lifetime value of the customer. Um, this is something where. Um, where analytics has played a large role in customers reorienting, uh, sorry, in companies reorienting their areas of focus to customers, not just for what you're gonna buy today, but given who you are as a customer, given where you are, given your relationship to this company, what, how can we start to estimate what your lifetime value as a customer would be? And again, dealing with two customers who might be walking in the store at the same time and one has a higher estimated lifetime value and one doesn't, what kind of time and energy and resources should the, that, that company expend on that customer knowing that that, has a, that person has a higher probability to, be a, to provide a higher lifetime value? So again, there's the, um, 
There's a famous model called buy till you die or a lifetime value of a customer. You're dealing with one of its key proponents. Um, this is a fun module to have um, because it's really applicable, not just, in fact, one of the prime examples in this space to answer another question that often arises. I'm going to give you two answers to questions that often arise. One, um, is this only for, for, for uh, private sector companies? And the answer here is no. We, we actually, the prime example in this module, um, we use a charitable work. Um, and annual donations. Um, so really, or any kind of organization um, that is, that is um, spending more and more time in the realm of business analytics, you will see as a, as a potential, um, you'll see some application for this course. And I, I'm looking at uh, Ambrin's question here, Ambrin on the uh, Q&A. It says, I'm a CPA practicing as an internal auditor. I want to understand how this course can help me in the audits, understand patterns and data, potential risk factors, if it really helpful when I don't have a computer science background. These are all now... Is this course for me, as, as Don mentioned earlier, can really has a wide spectrum. This is a, a broad-based data analytics or business analytics course. So you will be the best person to answer that. I will say, if you do not have a computer science background, you will be fine uh, for this course. As I said, this course stays away from coding. It stays away from tools. We don't, we don't, we're not shy about mentioning it. But it's not it, that understanding of those tools is not um, needed to do well in this course. Then we, Sergey Savin, uh, does a pair of modules. We start to bridge the gap between predictive and prescriptive analytics. We start to use a, a famous um, an add-in tool in Microsoft Excel. The the one tool that we do use is a spreadsheet program. Now, for most people, it's Microsoft Excel. Uh, for others, it can be Google Sheets. Both of them have the statistical add-ins or packages that enable this kind of general type analysis. But it, it, it's we start to use statistical tools um, to begin to forecast. Um, and, and this is all what we say, this is the handheld version. In other words, you're wa the professor is walking you through uh, different scenarios and with the problem and then the answer so that we're not, we're not leaving it to you to go struggle through a spreadsheet over a few days and come back with an answer. We want, it, we want to help you to generate the answer right in front of you so that you'll see that when it comes to the optimization when it comes to some of the regression analysis um, that these are these are the basics of understanding what goes into any kind of artificial intelligence or machine learning process is understanding some of the the statistical thinking and mathematics behind it um, and again here we actually then take one more module that Dr. Savin actually gives us, gives us a double, gives us a two week module uh, because he's then, we're then applying those programs to potential optimization problems when we don't, sometimes when we know the variables and sometimes when we don't. Um, and again, um, these, are, these are famous business school cases that we're breaking down and applying in the context of this course. Then we get into uh, what, is, what is often known as a fan favorite and you'll, you'll have the chance to meet with Dr. Bidwell live um, when we talk about people analytics. People analytics is an entirely separate field. Um, you could take courses, you can even take multiple courses just in the field of, of people analytics. Um, we're gonna give you a small taste of it here in this module. Um, in this particular case, um, we look at different ways to evaluate and make objective employee performance. We also look at, um, uh, we use regression analysis to understand the why, why employees leave firms. And especially now we're in the era of what's often described as the great resignation in a in transformative time as we move through the pandemic and into you know, the beginning, what we hope is the post pandemic phase. Um, and we're, we're having to understand the same old problem of how do we retain, how do we recruit, retain, hire, sorry, recruit, hire, retain the best people, the people that are most aligned with our organization um, in the most um, time effective, cost effective way. And so we look at, for example, using um, a regression analysis to correlate the reasons why people leave a company and, and use that as a way to perhaps institute preventative measures. It's a fan favorite because we can all relate to the person leaving the organization or the organization being left. And this is a great way to apply some of these statistical methods to an age old problem. Um, then we, uh, Ron Berman comes on, he's, uh, he's famous for the, what, what's really an integration of microeconomics uh, with a little bit of behavioral economics with business analytics. Um, and we look, for example, at a customer's willingness to pay. We analyze price bundling. We look at some of even some companies like Apple and Amazon and companies that are that are that use uh, price bundling or planned obsolescence or any of these any of these tools to really get at the exact. It, the more they understand about how much you are willing to pay for a particular item, 
um, the more that pricing analytics can really be played to work. So this is the beginnings of what people, people often refer to pricing or revenue analytics, but it's in the context of, of that move into prescriptive analytics. Um, so this is a fun module as well. Then we get into uh, really what's my favorite because I see uh, one, you, you get a nice live session with Dr. Gans, um, and these decision trees fall at the basis of AI and machine learning. If you want to understand how any kind of artificial neural network works, how any kind of, of artificial intelligence that's in the marketplace, you need to go back to the decision tree, understanding what weighted average probabilistic decision making means to you and your organization. So we start with really the pen and paper equivalent. We start with some of the age old decision tree problems, understanding how to engage when, when you know when, when there are probabilities and outcomes to be evaluated um, and understanding you know, outcomes that can often be valued with relative ease. In other words, it's a relatively linear process to understand what a particular outcome may mean financially, materially, otherwise to a company. Also, but understanding what those probabilities are, what tools can we have to un better estimate those probabilities? Because again, we can have the best outcome in the world, but if there's a low probability of it happening, again, you're, the crux of machine learning is multiplying a probability times an outcome and understanding the basics of that and understanding how to get to um, decision trees and that methodology um, is a fantastic way of, of really understanding the beginnings of AI and ML. Um, then we get to module nine. Uh, from a branding perspective, this is sort of your reward for, uh, for slogging through the first eight modules because uh, the first eight modules of the course tend to focus on the underlying functionality. Um, this is Wharton, as Don says, Wharton, Wharton's place in the world of business analytics is not accidental. Uh, it spent the last 140 years um, engaged in the what what we often call the under the you know, the underneath business the under the hood business analytics um, back before there were automobile hoods, um, but this idea that understanding the solution really requires a complex understanding of the problem, being able to analyze the problem, and therefore um, being able to then come out with a with a solution. And so week nine we tie it all together. We look at some of the bigger brands in the marketplace, not because those are the only examples um, that matter, but because they're often familiar to us as consumers and uh, and they're fun ways to tie some of these contexts together. Eric Bradlow is one of the most well-known marketing professors, not just at Wharton, but really in the world. Um, and it's a fun module. It's a nice way to, to tie it all together. So again, we have several ways where we, we you know, the, the question I think um, uh, Kambayagari looks at, um, Kambayagari, excuse me, Kambayagari has a question about how, di how deep is each module covered? And that really depends. So much. anytime we cover, uh, we go into a certain level of depth in the module, the more depth we go into, the more we're providing, whether it's through answer keys or a guided solution. Again, we're not, we wanna make you think, we don't wanna make you struggle. Uh, because that's, you know, in the world of executive education, that's the trade-off, uh, is that you are all, we are all busy, uh, you are all busy professionals, uh, and we want to make sure that you're getting exposed to these functions and tools without having to struggle through um, hours and hours of work. Um, so as I said, we, we generally expect that you'll be giving between four and six hours of learner effort each week. And if you happen to have a particularly busy week, you can survive on, on a little bit less than that. If you happen to have more time to dedicate, you can always find more to uh, read or support. So, um, but generally that's, that's what we will offer here. And I see the questions piling up. We'll get to those in a moment. Um, we also have some ways of conveying information. We use case studies, we use articles. There's actually a simulation um, in, uh, I, I believe it's week four, week five, where um, we engage, um, again, this is one of the, uh, this is classic business school where um, there's a Harvard Business School simulation case that's very, it's a, it's a marketing simulation case or a marketing analytics case where we actually tie decisions that you're making based on the information you have with uh, projected results at the beginning of the year. It's actually a four-year simulation. It only takes a few minutes to do, but it allows you to see consequences of actions and spending decisions that are, that are being made. It's a fun tool. It's a fun, it's a nice add-on to the course. And then, of course, the live webinars, as I mentioned. So during the course, you will have four live faculty webinars. So each week during the course, you will get a batch of 
videos, um, and not only videos, but assignments, discussion items, et cetera. Um, again, usually about 60 to 70 minutes worth of videos. And then the rest of the time is spent, um, again, answering questions. There's a quiz that it doesn't count, but it's a, it's a self-test that you get to help to absorb the information. There are There is an assignment to complete each week. Usually the assignments are reflective in nature, never more than a few paragraphs of writing. Um, sometimes it's working through a spreadsheet or projecting a, uh, or reflecting on what your specific experience is. And then each week you'll also have um, an op an chance at least one, if not two office hours to attend with your TA or course leader. Um, in addition for half the week, so four of the, uh, four of the nine weeks uh, plus an introduction, so really five, um, we have live faculty webinars. So you'll be meeting Dr. Gritner, who's the faculty director of the course, um, who is one of the more well-known accounting professors again in the world. Um, and then you've seen the modules with Dr. Fader, Bidwell, and Gans. And these are these are wonderful webinars. You are interacting directly with the faculty on a Zoom call. You can ask questions. Um, and in fact, most of the professors will will actually are relying on your questions and feedback um, to have to generate um, the right momentum and, and enthusiasm for the session. So those are a lot of fun, my favorite parts of the course. In terms of the kinds of people that answering that question is this is this course for me? Um, again, you know, it, it's a, business analytics is a widely applicable term, uh, and, and there are very few industries for which business analytics does not apply. And you can see it here in terms of the participant profile. Uh, we've had uh, well over two thousand participants in this program over the last three or four years. I can't. Even, I, We'll have to get the exact number, but it's in the, it's in the thousands, um, and it, it's a wonderful. We really we're we're constantly impressed by the the caliber of participants that we get, also the breadth of industries that are represented, industries, geographies, etc. Um, we have some testimonials. Your learning advisors can get you more. Um, again, it, it's I'd rather let our participants do the talking, um, but it's been a it, it's been a it's been a wonderful ride with this program. And the nice thing is that you have this combination of content that has is standing the test of time, as well as these live webinars and live interactions that bring it up to the present day. Um, and it's and it's really a nice way to get a taste of business analytics in a broad based course setting. Um, Again, so some of the features help at your fingertips. You are never more, you, you have a, a support button on your Canvas platform. You can always get email answers within 24 hours. You can join weekly office hours. Um, you can interact with the, with the faculty during the live faculty webinars. So there are several ways, several channels for you to uh, engage in active discussion uh, with representatives of the course and with each other. Um, and just to recap some of the key benefits of this course, again, the benefits are going to be different for each individual. Um, you know, to Christine's question about networking opportunities. Um, now, it, for those, I, I will say this, there's an old adage, you get out of the, you get out of anything what you put in, you know, what you get out is related to what you put in. Um, for those who engage, for those who attend weekly office hours, for those who engage with the faculty during the sessions, for those are the ones who, you know, put questions in the Q and A box or use the hand raising tool to ask uh, to 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 engage directly. Those that's where those of you will see the benefit from the networking side. I mean, for um, again, this is a twenty four hundred dollar course to be able to have this incredible amount of information to be able to have that sort of VIP hand holding experience with the course leader to be able to access faculty. But for you to then have a networking benefit on top of that really depends on you. And so ways to do that, for example, we encourage people to fill out their profiles on the Canvas platform during those discussions as you interact. Even if you're not interacting live, even if you're interacting over a discussion board, people share their backgrounds, they share their stories. Um, what I can promise you is that if you're looking for new contacts, new networking opportunities, uh, potentially new lifelong colleagues, you will find them in the course if you look for them. If you are just taking the course because you want the information and you're not as interested in that piece of it, then there's something in there for you as well. So it really is a wide spectrum of, of gains. You're not forced to interact with one another, but you are given many opportunities to do so. And then a brief mention with a couple of questions about Excel. So I'm going to get to those in a moment. This is the certificate that you're getting. Of course, Joseph Wharton, the founder of the Wharton School, has long since um, passed, but this was this would be what his certificate looks like. Um, again, it is a certificate program. 
Um, I don't, it, this is not for us to tell you, but I, I will say oh, in the last 10 or 15 years, the, the level of acceptance and recognition of individual certificates has skyrocketed in the business world. Um, so what used to be seen as, as a bit more of an, an alternative is now very much not only mainstream, but in some ways much preferred um, because this, is, this represents a focused effort to gain a specific area of knowledge, again, without leaving your day job, without necessarily leaving your work environment, or if you're busy on the home front without, um, you know, without giving up um, more than a few hours a week of your, of your family or home obligations. So on the apply, I believe our, our folks are going to put the uh, put a link in the chat about the apply. Now, most of you probably have started the process. There is usually a one week orientation week. So during that week, you can fill out your profile. You can get accustomed to using the course platform, which is a, a Canvas based platform. Um, you can get up to speed, making sure your technology is up to speed so you can use Zoom and join in all the events. Um, and then it's about three months. Um, it's technically, it's it's nine course modules plus the orientation week, uh, plus there'll be a holiday break. So um, you figure about three months um, and, and to do this course. Um, and that's the nitty gritty. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic course to take. So Don and I are going to look at some of the questions now. I, I see, uh, I will talk about Excel in a moment. Um, I love the networking opportunities question. So the, so it, we, Excel is a wonderful tool. In fact, one of, Chris Itner always likes to say, well, one of the, don't ever underestimate Excel. Uh, if you have any kind of, 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 of analytics model and you have less than a million lines of code or a million items of data, Excel is often the, a great place to start. And between the graphics capabilities of Excel, between the statistical add-on packages that we have, that are they're free add-ons that the professors will give you instructions on how to download. Um, Excel will do anything you need it to do in the context of, of your basic understanding of business analytics. The good thing is, it, and, and for those without Excel, we, as I said, Google Sheets has a, an acceptable, um, is an acceptable substitute. Um, and it really allows us to be tool independent because again, this is not a coding course. There is no, we, we, we will talk about Python and R um, and some of the other languages that are used for, uh, or some of the other yeah, the, the coding tools that are out there in the marketplace. What we, all, what we talk about this course is really the role of the analytics translator. Um, forgetting about the code, but understanding what are the results of the model and what, what do those results tell you and how can you use that to impact your business strategy and your, your business development moving forward. Um, so yeah, so all these questions about Excel and coding, these are great questions to ask, but yes, Excel is the, is the um, you know, we will use it. Some of the modules don't use any spreadsheet analysis at work at all, but others, if we are using any kind of program, it's limited to Excel or Google Sheets and your, um, and then as I said, what you do after that, for example, people ask about Tableau. Tableau is a wonderful data visualization tool. Um, hopefully the, some of the, 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 the lessons and tools of this course will uh, help you to appreciate some of the results of Tableau in a little bit more, but we don't engage. In fact, some of the visualizations that you can do in Excel, are, are all, you know, they're not quite as intuitive and they're not quite as creative as what Tableau does. But again, for the purposes of having this broad-based introduction and really focusing on that role, as the analytics translator, as the person who stands between the world of data science and the CEO um, and everything in between, that's really, so just uh, to Ryan's question too, no coding will be done during the course. Dave, let me chime in on this uh, translator role too, to, so that people understand how that ties into this class. The, uh, this is something that both McKinsey and Tata Consultancies have uh, identified as the main reason that uh, business analytics projects at different companies have failed, is that we uh, have uh, a collection of people who are very good at data science, at uh, data manipulation. Uh, they may come out of IT, they may come out of, um, you know, Python programming, um, and they understand the data warehouses they understand new ways to collect data that are available to us. Um, and that's all well and good. On the other side of the house, you have C-suite executives, business managers who have P&L responsibilities, who all have a theory of the case. They have a theory of what, uh, of why their company and their division or their product line works, what value it brings to the customer base or to the market. Uh, and underneath that uh, uh, gut level sense of value is an actual hypothesis 
uh, with uh, variables that are under the control of the company that affect various outcomes or have an impact in the market. And the, the problem that McKinsey and uh, Tata saw in their studies was that there was no one who was able to have an in-depth conversation with both sides of the house. So we need people who have an understanding based on a survey of the available tools and frameworks uh, and uh, best practices uh, who can collect together the questions or the hypotheses from the C-suite that are addressable by the data that the company either currently has or can identify projects to add to those data stores to directly affect and address those questions. So uh, it's a little challenging uh, to see at this stage, perhaps, but that part of the work you do in this class is probably more important than what you are understanding from the technologies. So the ability to really probe the logic um, of your strategy in your company uh, is critical uh, to getting the most out of this class. Um, and so it's something to think about from, from day one, but it also explains why we're exposing you to a wide variety of uh, applications of data analytics across marketing and operations and human resources, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's because the role we see is one of a, a translator who sits in the middle of a complex system and is able to talk to the data science people and to the C-suite executives in order to actually apply data to a decision. Fantastic, thanks, Don. Um... I can answer this question um, about the advanced course. So yeah, there, there are several business analytics offering. Uh, I, I will tell you, we're living in a golden age of online program offerings, and especially with regard to business analytics, which um, has the added um, added feature of being a course that is is relatively new. In other words, elements of business analytics, some of them are age old. Um, but there is a uh, there is an advanced business analytics program. Um, it's something that we uh, we 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 Wharton has a, if not the leading program, uh, one of the leading programs in the world on that. Um, it's a different. It's a it's a twelve month uh, program. There's a core program. There are electives. It's something your learning advisors can can happily speak to you about. It's very different. What we found is actually uh, we we've, we've had people who have done both. In other words, they will take this course to get some initial exposure. I would say this course focuses on more of what's under the hood, if you will, some of the method, some of the underlying methodologies that go into business analytics. Mm -hmm. The advanced program gets into things like visualization. People had asked before about Tableau and web scraping and other sort of tools that are being used. Um, they also get into our, the mechanics of artificial uh, intelligence and machine learning in much more detail. There's just more time to do that. Um, and the content is more geared toward AI and predictive analytics. This is a more broad-based course that covers a little bit of everything. Um, and again, and, and, and to be fair, there's also a different um, price point. The, the Advanced Business Analytics Program is a is much more of a cohort based. Um, the the groups are smaller. They're you know anywhere but twenty five to fifty people, and you're getting to know everyone much you know to a much stronger degree. You're you're working together during the uh, during those twelve months. In a course like this, you do as I said, there are opportunities to engage um, if you take advantage of them. Um, but as I said, it's it's a slightly different kind of experience. Um, so that's, there is a difference. And I, I would say, Abdullah, you can look at the two programs side by side. Um, as I said, they are very different in terms of, in terms of commitment, in terms of price, in terms of content. Um, and they're not mutually, there are people that do take both. Uh, and, and again, in the order, which may depend more on your schedule than anything else. So using activity-based management and balanced scorecard, we analyze data in various ways. How will this be different than those tools? Well, this will build on some of these tools. So we, we will mention, uh, the, these are mentioned throughout the course and in, in the you know, some of what you're describing is mentioned in the course, but you're also dealing, um, again, you are getting involved um, and we're taking a deeper dive into, you know, certainly with um, things like, um, uh, you know, when, when you're getting each professor's take on these various tools, and it's just you're going into a deeper dive each week. So, for example, you know, people analytics, you're going to a much deeper focus on you know why people leave organizations and how do we use regression analysis. And you're looking at um, you know the buy till you die model, which which again you can you can sort of get a certain amount by reading an article. It's it's far different than to understand lifetime value in a way where you're actually you know acting as a practitioner. Um, so it's just a deeper dive into some of these tools and adding onto those. 
to Akhil's question. In, any, if, yeah, go ahead. Let me put in a plug too, though, for the uh, for the balance scorecard. Chris Hittner is a, a big fan of uh, some, what's some, sometimes called strategy maps or balance scorecards. And for example, one of the things that balance scorecard asks you to do is to think about your uh, capacity building in terms of uh, the kind of the baseline core competencies of your company and the metrics that, in the, that uh, would tell you whether those capacities uh, uh, are building or not. Uh, and in, in, in that sense, then, as Dave was mentioning, uh, one of the resources that you have available to you that's critical to your success is your people. So what we're looking at then is a deeper dive into the balance scorecard from the perspective of, of people through uh, engaging with uh, Matthew Bidwell and the work of the People Analytics Initiative to get a better sense of what data actually does speak to uh, your ability to, let's say, in a, in a field like financial services, to retain critical uh, staff members. Uh, as those of you involved in financial services know, um, turnover in financial services, particularly among financial advisors, can be very detrimental to a firm if the turnover is large, because the um, affiliation of the market to the firm is actually an affiliation or a drive or connection between the market and the specific financial advisors. So, over, uh, so in, that, in that context, in that world, then the issue of attrition is quite important to measure and keep a handle on. Uh, and that has its place in the balanced scorecard. Now, all of that is to say that um, what we're looking at here is an effort to bring to the table on one side of the table, a collection of the top academic minds who are studying aspects of business. Uh, and they sit on one side of the table. On the other side of the table, our top practitioners, that's you. That's who we're trying to find here today. People who are experts in their own business and in their own role, because we think it's in the conversation between those two sides of the table that new knowledge actually emerges, that we push the envelope um, uh, on topics associated with business analytics. And this is an emergent field uh, with new forms of data and new forms of data analysis uh, being developed every day. Uh, so this is an opportunity to um, engage in that community of inquiry uh, from your own perspective, from the world you come out of, uh, talking directly to the people who are looking at these industries um, from an academic research scientist point of view. Thanks, Don. Um, and to Akhil's question about data visualization tools, uh, as I mentioned, we do we, we cover um, Tableau relatively extensively in our uh, advanced course. We don't have time you know, that we don't have the time or the wherewithal um, to do that here. Uh, but again, it's, it's uh, you know, it, 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 this is more of the underpinnings. But again, speak to your learning advisor about sort of the different offerings that are available. You may end up wanting, and again, we're not, we don't want you in this program if this is not the right program for you. So we're happy to give you agnostic advice. We're not looking to sell you something per se. We want to, we want to make sure this is right for you. And so if there, you know, we may, if you're looking at data visualization and only data visualization, there might be other, other, you know, programs we can, we can happily talk to you about. And you're, as I said, speak to your learning advisors about that. This is, you know, this is a learning journey, not a sales, you know, exercise or widget. So we want to make sure that you're actually in the right place. And again, depending on where you, where you see visualization in the context, this may, you know, you may want to try a different direction, but you can, as I said, talk to your learning advisor. In terms of pricing, um, Eunice, I, I, it's a great question. I, again, that there's uh, the specific model, I'm thinking about Ron Berman's module, uh, module six, I believe it is, when we talk about the buy till you die, uh, the, um, well, one, the buy till you die model is, is one, it has a, has a pricing analytics focus, but also the willingness to pay, which is all about pricing analytics. So um, again, I, every, you know, Whenever we get that, is this course for me question, it really depends about, uh, you know, much on you and, and your appetite for learning and going beyond um, you know, your, your specific area into something a little bit more broad. Um, but in general, I, I would think that this would be, um, this would be a nice add on to your, um, your current knowledge base. Um, yeah, Christine, I, in terms of how many participants, uh, it's, too, I, I, I don't know. I, I think we're probably around 100 for this um, for this run. It's always hard to tell, um, you know, because it's, you know, there's the, this program is offered about every two and a half months or so, and there's always an ebb and flow in the last couple of weeks in terms of um, in terms of people um, signing up or enrolling or the admissions. But it's it's um, 
you know, we will, we do staff accordingly. Every time we get above a certain amount, we have another course leader on hand just to give you more, um, uh, more chances to attend office hours. Interesting question. So eventually I want to complete an MBA at Wharton as well. Does this program get taken into account in admissions? So there, this is a certificate program. This is, um, you know, the, the, the professors, many of the professors, if you do come to get your MBA at Wharton, you'll recognize these professors because everybody, you know, they all, these are, these are the star professors and they teach MBA courses as well as even some undergrad courses. Um, but these are technically, this is a separate uh, program. So I, the, the knowledge gained in those courses and the experience may certainly be helpful in the admissions process, but I don't want to promise you something that, that neither Don or I are in a position to execute. I mean, is it, um, you know, is it ever a bad idea to learn, to learn something new and to take a program and to demonstrate how that knowledge works? Of course, that's a great idea. Um, I would certainly be, as, as I said, I, I don't want to make a promise that I don't have the tools to keep it, I, I, you know, in terms of that sort of specific level. You know, technically, these are, you know, it's a nice way to be part of the Wharton community. Um, but as far as a, a specific admissions process, I'm just not able to, I, I can't speak to that with authority. Don? I, I know a little bit about that project. I worked a bit with the People Analytics Initiative. Uh, and the uh, Warden MBA admissions office when we were reviewing the algorithms uh, that are used in ranking applications. So um, as you probably know, it's we uh, at Warden, I think the exception, the acceptance rate is like one in seven applicants, something like that. So, and there, at the time I was involved with the project, there is, again, was driven by one of the faculty, Cade Massey, one of the directors of the People Analytics Initiative was working with the uh, admissions department. And they identified about a hundred metrics that they were looking at that you could collect from an applicant and were using it to forecast success uh, in Wharton and beyond. Uh, it's tricky to get beyond. So they could at least use that uh, data model to forecast success at Wharton. Uh, and it's, it's an ongoing iterative process. So every year they revisit all of those metrics and shift the weights. It's also, um, you know, informing a, a human decision uh, that's being made by the admissions committee. So the short answer, Christine, is it's, it's hard for even somebody like an insider like me to be able to, to know to what extent um, the completion of a course like this would impact your, uh, the evaluation of your resume. So, but I wouldn't count on it. Thanks, Don. Um, now, what determines whether or not you pass the class and receive the certificate? Thank you for asking. Will there be exams or is the class mainly centered around projects and tasks? Um, so the, there are nine modules and there are nine assignments. Um, these assignments, tend, some of them are um, discussion entries. Again, uh, we want you to reflect on what this means to you and your industry. It also forces you to do some of that networking that Christine was asking about um, when you're comparing and contrasting your own experiences. Um, other times we ask, we walk you through the whether it's through Solver or one of the Excel-based assignments, we do provide an answer key if you're struggling. So again, it's not necessary, but we also want you to take, we want to see the evidence that you've actually done um, some of the work to get there. It's all template-based. The assignments are rarely, will rarely take people more than 30 to 60 minutes to complete. And if they do take longer, it's because you're actually learning something and, and enjoying it. Um, you have to complete seven of nine assignments in order to get the course certificate. So the difference between this and let's say something you would find on Coursera or edX or something like that is that this is a, it, not only is it a batch to release videos um, where everyone's learning the same thing in the same week at the same time, but you're all, ha you're having to complete these assignments. Um, there are quizzes each week, but these are self-test quizzes. So the, the grades on the quizzes are just that they're multiple choice quizzes, um, but you are the only person that's, we see the metadata, but you're the only person that sees your own data. You can take the quiz as many times as you want. You don't have to take them. Um, but the, as I said, the, the assignments, um, they're all template based in Canvas. They're, they're not, um, as I said, they're not backbreaking. They tend to be either um, the spreadsheet based or reflection based. Um, and as I said, you complete seven of nine. Can I have an opportunity to see a sample video from the class? It's a great question. I don't know what we have that's available. I'd speak to your learning advisor about that. Um, that's something that we may be able to incorporate into future presentations. Um, as I said, you've got some great, I mean, the videos are, are fantastic. Um, Manish asks, uh, how many sessions will be interactive? Um, and then any specific case of, of, of retail will be used for learning. 
Um, yes, on the retails you saw with the Eric Bradlow model, I think it's module nine, uh, we cover a lot of retailing brands that are very familiar to us as, as consumers. Um, many, of, many of us have actually um, either worked with these companies as well. Um, in terms of interactivity, so each week you'll have at least one, if not two, a choice of two office hours to attend with a course leader. The course leaders are experienced professionals who also have familiarity with this course. So they're TAs, but they're also people you can uh, have who are lead guided discussions and you can bounce ideas off of. You can also meet with other colleagues, those who also engage in the office hours. So that's once a week, if not more than one. As I said, you usually have a choice of one or two to attend. In addition, we have four um, live faculty sessions, as we mentioned. So with Dr. Itner, Dr. Gans, uh, so Chris Itner, Noah Gans, uh, Matt Bidwell, and Raghu Iyengar. Um, and these four sessions um, take place you know, about every two and a half weeks during the course. Um, and, and those are fully interactive. Um, in fact, the professors will tell you right off the bat, they would rather spend more time answering your questions. And then only if they have to, they'll spend time on the slides they've brought in to prepare. So they'll do both. Um, so hopefully that answers your question there. Okay, um, any other questions? I see there are a couple of things on the chat. There was a, a mention of the fee. Um, yeah, there is an early, um, at, there's an early, uh, um, the reason there's a, a, a fee differential there, it's a lower price, uh, I think on this, uh, on this slide here, uh, because it's an early, um, uh, it's an early application uh, discount. That's a standard practice here. If we get in, as I said, we get just by nature of this because our 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 uh, because you're so busy as professionals, and just because of the deal, the fact that we're dealing with high caliber executives, um, we there is an incentive for you to apply not at the last minute. Um, people sometimes just again by nature, by the very nature, uh, we can't always control that. So. Um, that's the uh, that's the discount. We provide you a little bit of incentive to make our, our administrative lives a little bit smoother. It's an opportunity for me to underline something as we're coming to the top of the hour here, which is the real value of this course, I think, is to get better at your current job and to get known for getting better at your current job by investing in a course like this, investing in your own development. So uh, the answer then to your specific question about the time frame on assignments is, I would try to early on identify questions at your own company that might be uh, part of what you're thinking through as you're introduced to the, the various frameworks and topics that Dave walked you through earlier. So uh, it's better to get uh, front loaded on understanding the value that's gonna come out of uh, uh, the two and a half months or so that we're working together. Um, and also let me highlight one other thing for everybody too, which is, um, the question earlier on about networking is very germane, I think, to this, which is, this is, a, you know, an, an open inquiry. This is not settled science. So we're hoping to stimulate your interest in joining a community of inquiry that will live on beyond the course. Now, in the, in the time of uh, GDPR and the various other concerns about uh, privacy and security, we do have to rely on you to opt in to joining those networking uh, uh, sessions so to fill out your profile and to reach out to people and you know form LinkedIn groups on your own, uh, particularly for people who are like minded you find in the class who uh, come out of a similar industry or a similar region or similar set of issues. So please use this as an opportunity to build your own personal network and uh, this framework is the foundation for continued study in this space. But there is a there is a week long there is a week deadline. We encourage you to keep up. What ends up happening inevitably is everybody pledges to keep up with their assignments. What we try to do, and, and your your course leader or your program team will be in touch with you. If you fall too far behind, two or three assignments behind, uh, it just makes it harder to complete all of them by the end of the course. But technically, all assignments, seven of nine assignments, are due by the end of the course. We strongly encourage you to stick with the week to week deadlines as much as possible. As I said, there is tends to be about 90 to 93% compliance each particular week, but stuff comes up. And, and again, we, we try to have the dual measures of rigor and flexibility so that we have a week to week content. Um, we're all learning the same thing at the same time, completing the same assignments by the same deadlines, but at the same time, life comes up and, and we have to be flexible around that. So that's the mix, it's somewhat paradoxical. Um, we did talk about a, a four to six hour learner effort to Jose's question. 
Um, that's a loose, you know, that, that's an average. Um, there are weeks where you can get by with two to three hours. There are weeks that you might want to spend more time, but having four to five hours, and it can be whenever you want. Um, again, this is asynchronous except for the live sessions. Nancy Deers, the course schedule, the, the, the bulk of the, the course is asynchronous. It's on demand. So each week on Wednesdays, you will get a, a batch to release. You'll get 60 to 70 minutes worth of videos. You'll get related assignments, quizzes, um, discussion um, areas to enter discussion items. And then uh, we will, once we get to the beginning of the course, we'll publish the possible office hours for each week. As I said, usually there's a choice of, of at least two office hours you can attend each week. Um, and then and the we office hours, we try to spread around. So if we have one in the morning, US Eastern time, we might have another one in the afternoon so that we're within everyone's waking hours, or working hours. And so that's, but again, talk to your learning advisor. This much of the schedule is already, you know, is already in place. So you should be able to get that information. Um, and then finally, and then we do have to wrap this up, um, Manisha's question, is this course fine for someone without any experience in analytics but wants to learn? Um, familiarity with analytic, various analytics tools is preferred. Now, th this course is designed specifically with no prerequisites. Uh, we, it, the, the less knowledge you have, I mean, as, as we said in the beginning, if you, if you remember something from your statistics class in undergraduate or even graduate level, or for some people, even, even secondary school, you know, there are elements of statistics and microeconomics and behavioral economics that, that play into business analytics. And of course, if you're comfortable with those topics, especially statistics, you might feel like you have a head start or maybe you might not be able to listen quite as carefully. Um, but this course is designed to catch everyone up. So you do not need any analytics experience. Um, and if you have some analytics experience, it just might be a little bit easier for you. But again, this course is designed specifically for those who do not have that experience. So I, I'll uh, give Don the last word, but from my standpoint, as um, again, as someone who's been involved with this program for the last three years, I, I can say I, I would love to welcome you into our business analytics family. Um, it is, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Um, and for me, not just being involved at this end of it, but also watching many of our participants go through and even speaking to them afterwards and understanding how this, this program has played into um, their professional lives um, as, as they've evolved you know, beyond this course. So thank you for all for taking the time today, being engaged with us for your fantastic questions about the program. Um, I do wish you all health and success and you know, stay safe and healthy out there. Um, Don, over to you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dave, and thanks to everybody for coming. And uh, we anticipate that uh, life is going to get better uh, one of these days soon. So uh, uh, best of luck in your businesses. Otherwise, stay safe, be well. Uh, better days are coming. Thanks, everyone. Take care.